Hello everyone and welcome back to game 16 of the 1972 World Chess Championship match between Robert James Fischer and Boris Vasiljevic Spassky. Uh, the result is 9-6 in Fischer's favor and by this point in the match uh, a, lot of player, a lot of people in Spassky's camp and uh, everyone in the Soviet Union were wondering if uh, there was uh, something else perhaps affecting Spassky's play. Uh, may maybe it was, uh, as they said, it was uh, hypnosis or maybe uh, they were affecting Spassky in some other fashion. Uh, Nikolai Krogius, Spassky's second, that, uh, said that this was uh, uh, science-ish nonsense and that there was no merit to it. Uh, Effing Geller agreed with him, everyone in the camp agreed with him. Uh, but as the situation in the match uh, kept getting worse and worse for Spassky, he had this, he had a lot of chances, but he, he simply didn't use them. If you've been following the match so far, uh, you... you uh, you could have seen that Spassky created amazing chances uh, throughout the match so far in the first 15 games, uh, but that he just didn't go through uh, and uh, won the games that he should have won. Uh, now, uh, there were a couple of uh, famous uh, psychiatrists, uh, uh, psychiatrists uh, visiting, and uh, they said that uh, Spassky should, uh, even though Fischer's protests were uh, uh, directed towards uh, uh, the chief arbiter, the organizers, and such, they are uh, most mostly they are affecting Spassky, and that Spassky should should either uh, disregard them uh, completely and uh, not even. Uh, listen to them or fight them actively. Perhaps he should uh, protest himself to fight, uh, you know, fire with fire. Uh, but uh, one such uh, famous Soviet uh, psychiatrist, uh, Mr. Vartanian, uh, visited Reykjavik uh, and he said uh, in his own words that uh, Fischer has a strong uh, personality of a psychopathic disposition and his behavior affects Spassky, but it is definitely not hypnosis or anything. Uh, and that then later on when the uh, situation really uh, became as it is now, 9-6 to six, and it's already game 16, uh, the Soviets thought that perhaps Fischer was using some sort of... Uh, uh, machines or, or electronic device, devices to affect Spassky's uh, thinking process and uh, they uh, filed an official appeal to the chief arbiter Lothar Schmidt uh, and Nikolai Krogius said that he was a very, imp uh, not impressed, but he was amazed that uh, Effing Geller uh, would actually do this because so far Geller dismissed all of these claims that uh, there was anything going on. And uh, rumors were that uh, they were doing it proactively. So if uh, Spassky loses the match, uh, then the consequences from the Soviet Union would be less severe. If uh, perhaps, you know, if uh, Spassky perhaps lost the match uh, due to him being influenced by Fischer in some way, then maybe maybe the con consequences will not be so severe. Uh, whether this is only a rumor or not, it's hard to say, but... Uh, it is well known what uh, happens to Soviet players when they lose against Western players. Uh, so, uh, 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 Effing Geller uh, filed uh, an official uh, protest to Chief Arbiter Lothar Schmidt and they uh, stopped the match briefly to inspect the playing hall. Uh, they uh, inspected everything from the lights as uh, special lights were installed, uh, uh, the one Fisher wanted. Uh, they specially inspected Fisher's chair. As Fisher had a custom made chair and it was a really uh, an impressive chair. You, you, you might remember that Spassky also had a, a custom made chair for him because he wanted one that swivels like Fisher's. Uh, and then wh while they were inspecting the chair, uh, they x-rayed Fisher's chair and they found uh, a small metallic uh, object in it. Uh, and uh, everyone was uh, really anxious about what it was and they immediately uh, took the chair apart. And what they found inside of the chair was a very small screwdriver uh, that uh, the workers that were assembling the chair left inside. So there was really nothing to it. And uh, when they finished inspecting everything, the hole, the chairs, the, the lights, the everything... Uh, they just found nothing and uh, they were really unimpressed with themselves and uh, Krogius said that uh, they really they really didn't need to do this uh, and also uh, <laughs> the reporters uh, the reporters had a very nice joke uh, they said that Fisher finally has a date uh, but it the woman they saw Fisher with was actually uh, a judge uh, from uh, from New York uh, uh, from New York Supreme Court uh, she came to Reykjavik uh, to inform Fisher that uh, his accounts was, were frozen and that his uh, money that he made from uh, the two books that he authored uh, uh, that he will not be able to use it uh, until he figures out uh, what, uh, what what's going on with uh, Chester Fox and this whole idea about a lawsuit uh, and uh, the Icelandic Chess Federation said that they will in no way be supporting Mr. Chester Fox in his uh, attempts to sue Fisher in, in Iceland. So there you have it, uh, a little uh, you know, intro into this game. 
Uh, and we have a game 16. Fisher again has the white pieces and he opens with e4. He hasn't opened uh, with e4 since game 10. Uh, Spassky replies with e5, knight to f3, knight to c6, and bishop to b5. Once again going for the Rui Lopez. Uh, a6, and here Fischer, instead of uh, bishop to a4, like in game 10, bishop captures on c6. Fischer had a lot of success with this exchange variation of the Rui Lopez in the past, uh, so Spassky, of course, and his team prepared a lot for it during the, the training camp. D captures, and here we have castles. Uh, Gligoric also mentions that uh, this gives uh, black uh, much more problems than the immediate d4, uh, because now after castling, uh, as Nimzovic would say, the threat is much stronger than the execution. Uh, now black really has to worry about this knight captures on e5 idea, and he has to make something, either bishop to d6 or f6. Spassky in this case plays f6. And okay, we have d4. Uh, and now bishop uh, to g4. Also capturing is e captures on d4, but uh, if you don't gain anything by capturing, no reason to capture. Uh, d captures on e5, queen captures on d1, rook captures on d1, and now f captures uh, on e5. Uh, there is uh, one game uh, Gligoric mentions where he played uh, first the bishop captures to ruin white's pawn structure here, and uh, Gligoric won that game. Uh, with black, but uh, Fisher also played one game where he had white in this position and Fisher won that game. So <laughs> Spassky made a, um, uh, a very, you know, calculated risk here. F captures on e5 and the engine definitely agrees with Spassky. Uh, rook to d3. Uh, a nice rook lift that unpins uh, this knight and also now rook captures on f3 is possible. If Spassky decides to capture, Fisher's uh, pawn structure on the king side will be will be intact, and this is not a new move. Fisher already played it against Smyslov in Monte Carlo in 1967, so Spassky uh, most likely knows this. Uh, we have bishop to d6, uh, and now comes uh, knight to d2. Uh, we have knight to f6, knight to c4, uh, and now knight captures on e4. Fisher plays knight c captures on e5, and now comes bishop captures on f3. Knight captures on f3, we have castles, and bishop to e3. Uh, b5, uh, and now comes c4. Uh, Fischer's idea is, since uh, he has a pawn majority on the king side, it's three pawns against two pawns, and Spassky does have a, a majority on the queen side, although his c pawns are doubled. He plays c4, and now Spassky can either capture and triple his pawns on the queen side, which will definitely uh, go nicely with uh, Fischer's rook, as rooks really love the doubles and tripled pawns. Uh, but his main idea is to bring the other rook over to c1, push c5, and block off the queen side completely. So if the queen side becomes blocked, and he can control the center with his bishop and knight, then perhaps he can mobilize uh, his pawns on the king side where he has uh, a pawn majority. So, okay, rook a to b8, Spassky is now preparing to capture on c4 and open up the v-file. Uh, rook to c1, Fischer is preparing to push c5, but Spassky doesn't allow it. b captures on c4, uh, and now comes rook to d4. Uh, if you play something like rook captures on c4 immediately, you don't, you're not really attacking the knight, because after rook captures here, you can't capture it. After rook b1 check, you have to give up the piece uh, just to prevent checkmate. A bishop to c1, and after rook captures, uh, only now you can defend it by knight e1. Not rook e1, as this would allow bishop to b4, but, but knight e1, and now you're simply down a pawn. Still, it's a double c pawn, but a much better position for black. Uh, so after bishop uh, b, b captures on c4, rook to d4, now you, you're definitely attacking the knight, now comes rook f to e8, defending the knight, and now you're keeping this knight on a beautiful e4 central square, and Fischer decides to force some exchanges to get it uh, away from there. Uh, knight d2, forcing exchanges, knight captures, rook captures, and now comes rook to e4. Spassky finds a very nice move that uh, will defend his c4 pawn, as his c, uh, c pawns are tripled now, and this is a serious handicap if you're not in time to defend it. But Spassky calculates properly. Uh, here we have g3 by Fischer. Seems like an odd move, why not king to f1, uh, getting your king into the game immediately. If king to f1, then Fischer would, uh, Spassky would indeed have bishop captures uh, on h2, unlike Fischer's, Fischer's captures, uh, bishop captures on h2 in game 1. Uh, because here g3 doesn't do anything, it doesn't trap the bishop, sorry about that, it doesn't trap the bishop because bishop can capture on g3. Pawn captures and now your bishop on e3 is unguarded. Rook captures and you just lost a lot of pawns on the king side. So after rook to e4, first g3, now the king can come into the game. Bishop to e5 and now uh, rook to c2. Fischer stubbornly is defending the b2 pawn and now comes king to f7. Spassky uh, is bringing his king into the game and Fischer does the same. 
uh, rook captures on b2, and now comes king to f3 with an attack on Spassky's rook on e4. A much better move than capturing on b2, because if captures, then Spassky has this very nice c3 move. Uh, rook bc2, and now captures here. Uh, bishop captures, and now rook comes to a4, and you can't capture on c6 because of rook captures on a2, and also the bishop on e5 uh, is very conveniently uh, defending the c7 pawn. Uh, so, uh, after this, rook to b2, uh, king to f3, like we said. Fischer doesn't have time for the in-between rook to d7 check, uh, because after king to e6, his rook is under attack, and after rook captures, sorry about that, uh, after rook captures, bishop captures, now comes rook captures on c7, but now uh, king attacks rook, and uh, while you have to waste time uh, to deal with this, for example, uh, rook to f7, black will simply start pushing his past pawn, and black will win this game. Uh, so, like we said, after rook to b2, king to f3 by Fischer, the strongest move. Uh, c3, uh, with this move, Spassky forces a series of exchanges that uh, will uh, really simplify the game, as you'll see. King captures on e4 by Fischer, c captures on d2, rook captures on d2, and now not capturing on d2, as this overly simpl simplifies the game, but rather rook to b5, preparing rook to a5. And okay, rook to c2 by Fischer, going after the doubled pawns. We have bishop to, c, bishop to d6, and now rook captures on c6. And Spassky goes rook to a5, attacking the a2 pawn. Uh, bishop to f4, uh, offering a trade of bishops. We have rook to a4 check, king back to f3, and now rook to a3 check. King to e4 back, and now rook captures on a2. Or you can simply continue checking, but uh, Spassky will try something else. Rook captures on a2, we have bishop captures on d6, c captures on d6, and now rook captures on d6. And here Spassky plays rook captures on f2. Uh, you could also try a5, but it's no better. After a5, uh, let's say rook to a6, you have to put a rook behind the passed pawn. Uh, a4, uh, white will push on the king's side, black will push on the queen's side. Uh, after you get the king behind your pawns, for example, g4, a2 is coming, uh, and now white can simply continue checking the black king, and uh, even though, even if black uh, somehow goes after the white rook here, doesn't really matter, you will never have a check uh, to give with the black rook, uh, and then after, if you have removed the rook, white will be able to gobble up this pawn, and still you've gained nothing. So after rook to d6, rook to f2, capturing a pawn, uh, we have rook captures on a6, and now rook captures on h2. Uh, and here, uh, Spassky is up a pawn, but uh, uh, this is a well-known theoretical draw. If you have two pawns on the king side against one pawn on the king side and two rooks, uh, then it's a draw. Two pawns mean nothing if there are rooks into the game, if, if the pawns are on the same side of the board. So here, Fischer simply played play king to f3. He doesn't allow rook to f2 to cut off the white king from the defense of the pawn. King to f3, and here, rook to d2. And here, uh, Spassky knows this is a draw. Fischer knows this is a draw. Pretty much everyone knows this is a draw. Uh, but perhaps because Fischer made Spassky come uh, finish the adjourned game uh, in game 15, uh, he had to come to play into the playing hall, even though they only played three moves and uh, the, the, a draw was offered by phone. Uh, perhaps this is why Spassky decided to torture Fischer here, even though there's really no way for you to win this game. But as there's no way to lose this game, you know, it really doesn't hurt to at least try. Perhaps uh, the other guy blunders. Uh, rook to a7 check, we have king f6, rook a6 check, king e7, rook a7 check, king rook to d7. Uh, of course, you don't want to trade rooks. If you trade rooks, then two pawns uh, are much better than one pawn. Uh, rook to a2, king e6, uh, king g2, rook e7, king to h3, king to f6. We have rook a6 check, rook blocks. Oh, again, you have to uh, decline the, uh, the rook trade. Uh, Spassky pushes a pawn, h6, rook a2, king f5, rook to f2 check. Uh, king to g5, and now rook to f7. So all Fischer has to do uh, is avoid a rook trade and uh, not fall into any <laughs> any checkmating ideas. Uh, we have g6, rook back to f4, not allowing uh, the king any moves, but the king doesn't really have all that many squares. Uh, h5, now comes rook to f3, rook to f6, and again declining the rook trade. Uh, rook to e6, uh, rook to f3, uh, rook to e4, rook to a3, king to h6. Uh, rook to a6, pinning the pawn, uh, rook to e5, king to h4, and now rook to e4 check. Fischer goes back, rook to e7, king to h4, rook to e5, uh, cutting the king off. 
uh, and also rook to b6, still pinning the, the g pawn, not allowing the pawn to be pushed to g5. King g7, rook b4, king h6, uh, rook b6, rook e1, king to h3, rook to h1, check king g2, rook a1, king h3, and here after rook to a4, this is finally move 60. The players agree to a draw, and here the result is 9.5 uh, to, to 6.5 uh, in Fisher's favor. So it's uh, the, the game could have ended 30 moves ago, but for some reason uh, Spassky decided to torture Fisher. Uh, perhaps it's uh, uh, his way of, uh, of using some sort of psychological warfare against Fisher uh, to, to get even with Fisher for, for using <laughs> such, uh, such uh, non-chess uh, things against him. Uh, but yeah, uh, an, an, an interesting game, but uh, Spassky really showed him that uh, against him that he really has nothing to look for uh, in the exchange variation of the Rui Lopez, even though he had a lot of success with it in the past. So yeah, uh, that's uh, the game. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank uh, James Crenshaw, Beat Matter, uh, Josef, uh, Josef Fodor, uh, Joffrey Cook, and uh, Jumi A. Barben for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you soon, uh, most likely with game 17 of this epic match. Thank you all, and I'll see you soon.